Welcome to Travolting. Hosted by Jeff Sweeney and Stuart Elmore. Covering Look Who's Talking Now. Enjoy the episode. Welcome back, everyone. Welcome. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Jeff, would you like to see who's talking now? Now? You're talking now. I am talking now. Yes. How's it, how's it going? It's, it's going pretty good. Yeah. Uh, to all the folks at home, thank you all for listening last week to our episode on Boris and Natasha, the uh, best movie ever. How long was it since we recorded that? I kind of blocked. It's been a while. As you folks have had a contiguous recording uh, listening system, contiguous. we have had an uncontiguous recording cycle. It's been probably two or three weeks, probably three or four, actually. Has, has it been that long? It has. We recorded... What, well, we're looking at a roster here. We recorded Boris and Natasha on the 16th of May. Wow. That's like two... That is like two... Three weeks ago, maybe. Yeah, it's like three or four. We are recording this on the 6th of June. Wow. Crazy, right? So, this is episode 20. This is episode 20. Congratulations. We made it. A uh, cue applause music. Uh, cue confetti. Uh, what if I put no sound in here? That'd be really awkward, wouldn't it? <laughs> <laughs> if I didn't put anything in here when we did that. It'd just be uh, very sad. <laughs> it, it would be pretty sad. It'd probably be more accurate, depending on how many people are watching. What, what are numbers at? Because, it, you know... Seven million people. Well... Every week. You're a lot of, I think you might be undercutting it. <laughs> undercutting? Yeah. I think, so you think it's more like 15 million? You're closer to eight. Eight million? Eight million. Oh, wow. Look at our Spotify. I yeah, think it's, going, it's popping off. It is popping off. Everyone's favorite show. But we want to thank you folks very much for uh, all 8 million of you who <laughs> yes, are thank enjoying you all for listening, every week. listening to every week of us talking about wonderful classics like Moment by Moment, yes. Chains of Gold, all and the great uh, movies. Basements, The Dumbwaiter, <laughs> <laughs> all those cinematic masterpieces that we have covered in such eloquent, delicious taste. Yes. Where we talk about hair. Yes, hair. Every week, all week. Yeah, so the hair. I'm like, when you, we started this podcast, Jeff, did you think the hair raking was gonna be? No, like, I, didn't, I did not believe it was gonna make it this far. Yeah, I thought it was like a one episode bit, one and done. And now it's in every episode. It's thing. in every single episode. I have to bring up this damn spreadsheet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, I feel like the hair is such a quintessential part of who John Travolta is as a human. Yeah, being. I mean, it represents whatever role he's doing. Like, it's it's yeah. a big part of the character. And whenever he is not, like, I don't know. I think his hair is an accurate representation of where he's at in his career. Yes. and it's no accident that. When his career kind of went under, so did the hair. Yeah, that the experts is the worst hair, and it's kind of like the lowest point for his career. Yeah. Like late 90s. Y yeah, I, I would say so. Uh, whereas, but it's weird that Staying Alive is my number one. Hey, it was the big, you know, it was, he hit the apex with Blowout, and Staying Alive was the immediate follow up. So he's still kind of near the peak. He is still kind of near the peak. Um, and he just has Rocky Three Rambo hair. Yes. And it's... Is this supposed to slow guy my hair? Yeah. Give the guy my hair. How you doing there? <laughs> <laughs> uh, okay. okay. So look who's talking now. now. Yes, now we're going to talk about look who's talking. But it's... Now. <laughs> but it's not... It's look who's talking and look who's talking to. It's not look who's talking three... It's well, Look Who's Talking Now because... Well, that's because there was never a Look Who's Talking To numeral. It was Look Who's Talking To, T-O-O, because there was another person talking. And who was that other person? It was Baby Julie, voiced Baby by Julie. Roseanne. Roseanne Barr! <laughs> and is Roseanne Barr in this? No. Is you know Bruce... who else also is in this? Bruce Willis. Bruce Willis is not in this. Who's in this, Jeff? Uh, Danny DeVito. And Academy Award winner Diane <laughs> Keaton <laughs> as the voice of two dogs. Yeah. Dane DeVito and Diane Keaton are voicing two dogs. Absolutely crazy. <laughs> um, you know, I will say I did write three pages of notes over this, but plot-wise, in terms of the content that we have to talk about, 
not much. Yeah, the, it's a pretty straightforward movie. It um, there's a little more happening in it than Look Who's Talking to. Mm-hmm. Um, I did, however, like on a pure enjoyment level, <laughs> kind of enjoy this a little more than Look Who's Talking to. Really? Yes. I don't think it's a better movie by any stretch of the imagination. Look Who's Talking and Look Who's Talking Two were directed by Amy Heckerling, mm-hmm. who is a genuinely good director. Yeah. With genuine vision. Yeah. And even if Look Who's Talking To was made under duress on her part, like she said she didn't really want to do the movie so quickly, or do the movie, period. Yeah. Um, it still kind of had her flair and her sensibilities. Yeah. Like her ability to just, just the basic talent of looking at a scene and constructing it artfully. Yeah. So still had a little bit of that. This one is made by like a total like non like non entity of a guy. Yeah, I uh who is who's the director His of this? His name is Tom Ropelowski. And what is what has Tom Ropelowski done? His Wikipedia is literally three sentences. And we know it's it's four sentences. But it uh but only three lines. Each of them is one paragraph of one line. It's a, I'm just going to read his whole Wikipedia because I can. Tom Ropolewski is an American screenwriter, producer, and director. He is best known for the films Look Who's Talking Now, The Lover Boy, The Next Best Thing, and The Kiss. Paragraph break. He's married to screenwriter producer Leslie Dixon. Paragraph break. In May 20, 2006, The Hollywood Reporter reported that Ropolewski and Evan Katz were hired to write the script for an action film entitled Game Boys for Walt Disney Pictures. However, as of June 2018, the project remains in development hell. And that's his uh, entire that's his wiki- entire Wikipedia. Yeah. On IMDb, he's only credited with directing two movies. Um, oh, my mistake. He is credited with directing five movies. Well, three, three of, are doc- two, three of them are documentaries that look like they were like it's called Tui teaching the twice exceptional. That doesn't uh, what what? Oh yeah, it's it's Oh, it's literally just a documentary on a uh, a high school in Los Angeles. Oh. Uh, he directed three documentaries that seemed to not exist. Um, what was he, Childs of Giants? Childs of Giants, a movie in 2010. Um, it's about um, Daniel Rhodes Dixon, uh, who's the child of Dorothea Lange and... So Maynard this all Dixon. being said, Tom Ropolewski hasn't done jack shit. Yes, he had directed one movie prior to this. Its name is Madhouse. Uh, Kirstie Alley's in it, which is how I presume he got this movie. Which she probably was like, hey, I know this guy. He'll I know a guy who could direct this. Um, R- Madhouse seems to also not really exist. <laughs> but um, as we had the problem with a lot of our previous movies, yeah. Eyes of an Angel, as an example... Um, I'm trying to think. another movie with that. Yes, Morrison. It is. There's very little information about the making of this movie available online. Yeah, like no one's writing like you know your 20 year retrospective on look who's talking now. Yeah, like it's not like um you know like Lord of the Rings is 20 years old this yeah. year and a lot of people are writing you know retrospectives about how it was made and new interviews with people. Yeah, like behind the scenes stuff. There's none of that for these movies. No. Uh, this one especially so i can find no information about the creation of it the only like thing you can really say about the conception of this movie is that the first movie is a monster hit made almost 300 million dollars on like a 20 million dollar budget yeah the second one did okay it only made let me uh let me quickly bring up how much the second one made um that that's yeah yeah, that's the first it's the first i know it i know i did it the second one made 47 million um off of a similar low budget so it wasn't like as much of a hit as the first one but, but it still made money it made enough money for them to be like we can throw a bone into that third one why not why not well we learned why not <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> uh but amy heckling declined to return she wasn't interested uh she wasn't interested in the second one it's kind of forced into it good for you amy uh when not being forced she definitely wasn't interested in this third one yeah um they kind of Without her mindset and her vision, Tom Ropolewski wrote the movie with his partner, Leslie Dixon. Wait, wait, wait. What's that release date say? Um, November 5th of 1993. God damn, that came out exactly two years before I was born. Ooh, rough. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
rough. Get it? Because it's yeah, a dog. Because rough, rough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, dogs talk in this movie, guys. Yeah. This, yeah. You, you thought you had it good with the baby talking movies? Bruh. The dogs are talking now. The dogs are talking now. Yeah. You know who's talking? Look who's talking now. The dogs. The dogs. Yeah. yeah. The, uh, this movie has no stylistic uh, comparison with the first two. Um, it's not really even about any of the same things. The first two are family movies about, you know, kids who have internal monologues that don't really relate to the main plot. Well, yeah, it's like there's two different movies happening and look who's talking and look who's talking too. It's and like the story can... between James Ubracchio and Molly. Yes. And in terms of their relationship. And then there's a subplot of like the kids, but it gets very blurred and obscured. So like, I guess you would say the first movie, it was about Mikey's wanting a father yes and daddy wanted daddy wanted and uh the second one is about might like again more drama between jack john travolta and Kirsty out and then there's drama between mikey and julie yes and it's it's parallel paralleling where it's like mikey needs to become a bigger brother for yeah. his sister or whatever so there's always some like kind of subplot with this yeah. this one's about dogs this one's about it, dogs it's so firmly like unrelated to the main plot line very much like they are parallel but never perpendicular they never cross like, what are their goals jeff the the dogs they, Did, they the, don't have goals they don't have goals one of them is like stuck up and one of them is a little too freewheeling and at the end they learn to like meet in the middle yeah but the, it's not something they're like aiming for they're just like oh i'm a dog eh? oh, <laughs> that was a bad danny well, DeVito, but... it's a danny devito it's like Anyway, I started peeing. <laughs> yeah, the, the dog thing is just pretty much them peeing. Um, the dogs are actually kind of entertaining at times, but on some moments, yeah, yeah. just because it's it's shot very much like Homeward Bound style, where you yeah. just have like B roll of like a dog looking in one direction, mm -hmm. then you put voiceover over it. Yeah. The the problem, I mean, we'll get into the plot in a few seconds here because there's not really much to say. Like I said about the conception, it happened. Um, this movie did not make money. Uh, they never made a fourth for obvious reasons. Um, what what and then, would you title the fourth one? Uh, it's Look Who's Talking Look to. Who's Talking Again. <laughs> Wait, that has a lot oh, no. of preconceptions. Or with it. Look Who's Still Talking. Look Who's Still Talking. <laughs> yeah. No, they should make a sequel now. Like 30 years later called Look Who's Still Talking. About Old Man Travolta. Um, old Man Travolta. Yeah, Old Man Travolta. He'd be, it would be Old Man Travolta and Old Man Kirstie Alley. She would come in with a MAGA hat. Um, Wait a minute. Where are you going with this? I, I, I want you to keep going. I'm, I'm spitballing. I'm spitballing. Oh, I'm, well, I'm riffing. I have one. Well, look it's, who's still talking to me. Look who stopped talking. <laughs> 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 and it would start... It would, start pan down from sky onto graves <laughs> james <laughs> <Urakia. laughs> who Luke. comes up and watches it's uh mikey and julie yeah. but in their like 20s yeah and then they then they walk to the side and they look down again pan on to another gravestone molly, molly Ubracchio. and then two small gravestones <laughs> next to it with with uh bones on them rocks, rocks and, and daphne <laughs> oh god and then that's when mikey looks up at the sky and bruce Wilson's voice returns inside yes! of him and is like i'm i finally achieved my higher state of being and the the scientology i am l ron hubbard yes this movie no connection to the the scientology discussions we've had in the previous two i don't know man there's some weird dream shit going on okay in this. there is some extremely weird dream stuff and i look i we're gonna talk about this later but i i googled some scientology things on dreams because mm. there were some things happening in dreams i'm like this is a getting a little bit trippy yeah like at some point i'll just say this right now but like at some point uh molly and james their dreams converge onto that each other true. that does have the incept they incept each other oh, yeah. it's they're committing the sin of incept yeah incept <laughs> <laughs> and uh yeah so it's a, it gets a little weird and it happens, I mean, I think that's the only time it happens, but there's just a lot of weird dream yeah. sequences in this movie. There's a lot of weird stuff in this movie that isn't connected. Um, connected. Like, there's um, some framing, like, where it cuts to, like, a child's drawing that, like, cuts, like, scenes up. Did you notice this? No. There are a few times where it'll, this movie will, like, after, John Charles will like, close the door, and it will cut to, like, a child's 
like a big piece of construction paper. Yeah. With like a child's drawing and like cutouts and stuff on it. Okay. And they'll say like, daddy left. And it's like the thing that just happened or the thing that is about to happen drawn by like a child is like a chapter mark. It happens three times. I don't know why. Like it's not consistent enough to yeah. be like, oh, this is separating this into three acts. Like one of them happens probably like 30 minutes in. The other two happen 10 minutes apart near the end. That's it's, so it's weird. Very I, I barely noticed it. It's very and like you see a few times the kids have those big boards. Yeah. Like it's things that they're doing. But if this movie does not like zone in on the fact that it's not important that the kids are drawing like this. Right. Um nor is it ever like oh here's you know chapter 1, here's chapter 2, daddy leaves, stuff like that. Right. No. It's just three times it happens and then never talked about again. Well, it should also be like uh, said that uh, M- Mikey and Molly are both. Well, Molly is still, or no, Julie. Julie, Julie and Mikey. Julie is still like a child. Yeah. Mikey is like above toddler su- mm-hmm. age now, where he's like starting to understand how the world works. Yeah. So, like, if it would be of any child perspective, it would be Julie's. Yeah. Probably, right? Most likely. She's kind of around the age Mikey was in the second one. Oh. Not exactly, but kind of. Yeah, kind of. And <laughs> Julie's fucking weird in this movie. We won't <sighs> talk about that. Um, <laughs> Julie, Julie is probably a wizard who is going to go to Hogwarts when I she turns 11. I am absolutely convinced that the kid from The Exorcist found new work. And uh, it is a young look he's talking now. <laughs> because... Uh, I didn't realize that that's where the meme. Right. That I didn't right. realize that's where the meme comes from. Yeah, the, the, the shaking, shaking the, the brush. thing. Yeah, that that's where it comes from. Is that yeah. one obscure movie that came out in 1993? Yeah, 93. The third installment of a John Travolta franchise. That uh, has there ever been another third installment of anything of John Travolta? No, he's done a few sequels, but never a third, except for this. Wow. What's and, that you know, say? Segue actually into Travolta for a second. Yeah. There's not much. Um, he's kind of like, he's real. he's truly, I hate to say this, but he's truly irrelevant at this point in Hollywood. Yeah, he really is. Aside from these movies, he has no hits. He has no, he has, most of his movies don't even make it to theaters. Yeah. Um, he's TV just, movies. TV movies, um, things that go right to DVD, things that aren't released for like three years after right. they're shot. He's not doing great. Um. Except for these movies, so it makes sense he comes back for this third one. However, this is the movie that kind of ends the stage of his career, because he gets Pulp Fiction right after this movie films. Yeah, and that's going to be a whole new stage into his career. But he always, I mean, I think we may have talked about this on the podcast earlier, but it's like, for Quentin Tarantino to look at John Travolta's recent work. Yes, and think this is the guy I need in my movie. Because also, I mean, what, what, I mean, I'm not a Tarantino bro, so I don't know much about his filmography, but he'd only done like River Dogs before this, right? River Dogs? Reservoir Dogs. Oh, fuck. <laughs> River Dogs. There's some River Dogs in this movie, but. Um, <laughs> it tells you how. Know, he'd how only done Reservoir Dogs. And Tarantino's just such a, he's such, I mean, we'll, we're going to talk about this next week, but yeah. he's such a, like a scholar and like such a, a student of film history and film as a thing that he has the long view and he doesn't look at Travolta's like failures in modern times and write him off. He looks at the promise of his early work as like a challenge. He needs to bring that back. Mm. And that's what Pulp Fiction is. And we're going to talk about that a lot. Next what if we week. just talked about it now? We skipped this episode. Just talking about Pulp Fiction. And that's the episode. Covering folks. Pulp Fiction. <laughs> uh, no. no, no, we got to talk about look who's talking yes. now. We gotta we gotta get through this movie so that so that we can conf- like have everything solid. Um, so let's just want, launch right into this movie. Yeah. Um. Right away, like this is when like right in the start of this movie, that's when I first understood it's like we're not Bruce Willis and Roseanne are, yeah. aren't in this because yeah. the kids don't even have voices anymore to replace yeah. them with. The the opening shot I actually like. I think it's a good opening shot, and I that was when I was like, oh, maybe this movie is gonna be like. I don't know, like, I, this movie is going to be interestingly directed. It is not. It but is not. <laughs> this opening shot is just a, stat, a long static shot of a hallway with a bunch of um, 
doors alongside it. It's a, right. an apartment hallway. And um, Travolta, Allie, Kirstie Alley, and um, the kids are, like, popping out of doors as, like, the parents are trying to put them both to bed and pick up yeah. their toys and make sure they brush their teeth and all this. It's an image of where their family is at right now. Yes, and it's just pure chaos. Um, it really stressed me out. <laughs> Julia's stark naked in the beginning. Yeah, Julia's stark naked. She's running yeah. around. Um, but it's just, like, it captures the vibe of, like, early parentage, yeah. I think, pretty effectively. Yeah. I'm not a parent, so I can't say with certainty, but what it really... What are you talking about? <laughs> what about Timmy? He's in the next room. Shut up. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> get down, boy. Uh, For folks who are listening, uh, uh, Jeff actually has a, uh, a 12-year-old boy named Timmy who yeah. he locks He's up in He's been the... locked in the closet for, like, 12 years. Um that that is not true for any child protective services listening. I do not have a, I do not have a kids. Jeff now lives in Wicker Park in Chicago. Come and find him. Oh God. Um, <laughs> but no, I think it pretty effectively captures that vibe of early parentage. Yeah. Um, and then you know after they finally get the kids to go to bed, they walk back and they're both so exhausted. Yeah. And it really and it shows them like still loving each other and being like that's. They the, still got the heat. That's the idea of this movie, is that, like, even through, like, the trials and tribulations of parenthood and all that that entails, you, as long as you have love, you got all you need. Yeah, they still M- got... Much like the song, you know, all you need is love. Yeah. John Lennon, great man, shot in the back, very sad. Well, you know who wasn't shot in the back? Danny DeVito. Yes. Who voices... We, we cut from there down to the street. Yeah. Where a cocker spaniel... And a German Shepherd uh, have just engaged in uh, coitus. And so we don't get a human full opening. Yes. But we do get... Yes, I, I had, did not put this on my letterbox list of full openings because I had not seen this movie. I did not know if it did. I did not expect it to because I knew there was no child being born. Right. I was very wrong. There is a full opening. Yes. It's a dog full so, opening. Yeah, the, this uh, this German Shepherd and this Cocker Spaniel, they hook up in an alleyway. <laughs> and, it, and guess what? The film shows it graphically. Yeah, this is... Like, it, it shows the dogs like having ten, for sex. For, like, ten minutes? <laughs> ten straight minutes. And at one point, the camera cuts, and the dog's just breaking the fourth wall. Yeah. Not, not just, like, looking right into the camera as he's, like, yeah. humping the other dog. It's very strange. It's I was not expecting that. Very, very shocking. And I was very disturbed. Like, did you watch all ten minutes? I'll be honest. I fast-forwarded through I, it. I uh, clockwork oranged my eyes open and watched the whole thing. <laughs> It had Beethoven's but, fifth over it too. Yeah, well, not Beto- Beethoven's fifth, but like the dog Beethoven's fifth, <laughs> like his fifth movie. <laughs> that's that's where they they came up with the Beethoven movies as they yeah. watched this. But no, there, there's not ten minutes of uh, unbridled dog sex. Uh, that might have been a little more interesting than uh, some of the things. I have I've... a lot of moments watching this movie where I see one scene go a certain direction, and I ap- when it happens, I think you know. All they would have had to done is just tweak some things and send it in a different direction. Yeah. And it makes this movie a million times more interesting. And that's one of those things you think that should have been the... Julie, as a baby, wants to fuck Charles Barkley. Well, we have to get to that. We have to... Wait, wait, wait. No, that, there's, that's a whole can of worms we're talking about, okay? I got some Charles Barkley thoughts. Um, oh, but no, first, man. this Cocker Spaniel, this German Shepherd hook up. Hook up. Uh, and then we cut to a closet. Yep. Where the Cocker Spaniel has five babies, five mm-hmm. puppies. Um, these This, like, uh, extremely New York couple's like, hey, what do we do with it, huh? Um, and uh, and, and yeah. they put them in a box and throw them on the street. And they're, and one of them has... Oh, and, like, in the full opening, by the way, they have voices, too. Yes. As uh, as the, the trilogy always does. Yes, two random dogs are just chatting. Yeah. And, they, and, they, and there's multiple eggs because, you know, dogs... Oh, yeah, there is have, a full opening of... You know. It's a litter. Uh, it's a hound dog this time instead of the uh, Beach Boy song from the first two. Right. Because, <laughs> r- listener, they're dogs. <laughs> Believe it or not. They're dogs. Yes, they're dogs. And it's like, yeah, ain't nothing about a hound dog. Oh, yeah. Um, so that happens. And Danny DeVito is all immediately like voicing this puppy, right? Yes, he's voicing the puppy. Yeah. He voices the, the dog from... Puppyhood to maturehood, or adulthood, I guess is the correct word. Doghood. Doghood. Puppyhood to doghood. Uh, Richard Linklater's doghood. It's like boyhood, except you're following a dog for 12 years. Isn't that just a dog's purpose? 
Um, yeah, except they don't like drown dogs while filming the movie. <laughs> um, they could. They, I mean, it it is a movie that it's a potential movie. It's not something that exists. So it's like Schrodinger's cat, except it's Schrodinger's dog movie. Yeah. Of the dogs could have been tortured or they could not have been tortured. And until it happens, we will never know. Right. So anyway, Danny yes. Vito was a dog. Danny Vito is a, is a little puppy, and he's yeah. just doing his DeVito thing. <laughs> right. And uh, so that's when, that's when I was understanding, like, what is going to be the subplot of the dogs? Because there's always been a subplot yeah. with all the other kids' voices, and I thought, what is this voice is going to be struggling with in this movie? And, like, my first thought was, oh, like... There, there's some dialogue with the puppies where it's like, who's that? It's like, that's their, that's mom's master or whatever. Yeah. And Dan DeVito's like, I don't want a master. Yeah, it's and, about the dogs learning to right, have a home. Have a home. Be a part of the family. Right. And so that's kind of where that subplot comes in with yeah. the dogs is they're learning to know what home is to them. Yeah. So the puppies get dropped off, and then unfortunately, we... at the end of the movie, they get put down. So yeah, it's <laughs> deeply sad. <laughs> yeah, um, it's graphic. Um, but we cut back to um, the family home, the uh, Ubracchio home. Because they're Ubracchio. all Ubracchios now. They're all Ubracchios. But um, Julie is just sitting on the floor, like still as possible, staring at a NBA game of Charles Barkley. Not moving. Yeah. It is unsettling. That's when I wrote, yes, this child is from The Exorcist. Um, but she just, like, is locked in staring. And she's, like, two. But she's very obsessed with Charles Barkley, as this movie goes in, gets into. Yeah. Um, we, and and, we and, and got... to clarify, she's not obsessed with Gnarls Barkley. It's the uh, the CeeLo Green man. She's obsessed with Charles, Charles Barkley, Barkley, the NBA player. Yeah, star of SNL and Space Jam. <laughs> well, we haven't uh, we haven't um, we haven't gotten to the dream sequence yet. We've this. not gotten to the dream sequence. There's a dream sequence that's really gonna hit it home. Yeah, for Julie's like intentions with Charles. Yes. What if like she wants to slam dunk on him? <laughs> Yeah, she but, probably wants to do a lot of things with Charles Barkley. Yeah. We're we're quickly uh, apprised as to the Ubracchio's like current situation. Yeah, and it's Molly's the breadwinner. She has a she still has her accounting job, um, full time. She's providing for the family. Travolta inexplicably is still a cab driver. <laughs> right. It's been what happened to his piloting job from the second one? Remember, he was a well, flight instructor. Yeah, I mean. Did he still keep that job at the end of the second movie? I mean, he doesn't fly up. They cancel all the flights. I don't think he gets fired. Mm. But apparently he did. He lost that job. Uh, he keeps going to interviews and never finds anything. Yeah. Um, and Molly doesn't mind. She's like, it's fine. We can basically live off my paycheck. Yeah. Until. But yeah, at the we get two things happening simultaneously. Yeah. Molly's at work fretting about James's job interview. She's like, right. he's going to mess it up he didn't dress well yada 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 yeah meanwhile troll is having a great time at this job interview with a british uh corporate executive named samantha uh, played by lizette anthony who um has been in some movies mm -hmm. <laughs> but um he's all of his charm that she was afraid would like serve him ill in a job interview is actually working on yeah samantha um, and she hires him for the job, which is her personal pilot uh, for the company she works at as the CEO. Right. Meanwhile, Molly gets fired. Molly gets a pink slip. Bum, bum, bum. And she faints right away. Yes, it's like, she's like, ooh, pink, that's pretty. Bam. Faints. Immediate fall. She she gets fired. Yes. Uh, th then, um, so when this happens, uh, John Travolta is like in the airport with his boss. Yeah. There's a weird scene that happens. Yes, because you know what I'm talking about. Like it's when J it's when he John Travolta is at the airport with his boss, and then as they're talking and they're bonding, I guess, or doing something. I don't know. Kirstie Alley shows up. Yes, with the kids. With the kids, and there's a lot of dialogue. And I just wrote down this whole scene is a bit awkward. Yes, because like they show up. Why? Who they're knows? On the tarmac. Uh, they're on the tarmac. They got on the tarmac. Yep. Somehow. Yep. And they're all talking about f five million. They somehow knew he would be there. Five million different things, and then it comes out that 
Kirstie Alley loses her job in front of John Travolta's new boss. And then John Travolta's boss calms her down and says, oh, well, I make a lot of money, so yes. James will be fine. Yes. And the Meanwhile, whole s- Mikey's, like, trying to climb onto, like, the conveyor belt for luggage. There's a lot happening Julie's in this one Julie's like, running scene. around. Mikey's also like, I want a dog. I want a dog. I want a dog. There's a lot of chaos going There's on. There's a lot of chaos going on that doesn't make any damn sense. Yes. Absolutely none. Yeah. So, uh... We, yeah. uh... After that madness happens, yeah, we cut back to DeVito Dog, uh, who does not have a name yet at this point. No, he does not have a name yet. Um, but he... Um, he's, he's in a box on the side yes, of the street. Yes, he's on a box on the side of the street. Um, Mikey and Travolta come by him. Uh, Mikey falls in love with him, but uh, the parents are like, no dog, no dog. Right. So they leave. Pretty and adamant a, about a, it. A biker <laughs> picks him up. Yeah, a biker and his uh, obese biker kid. son obese kid <laughs> i'll never forget that from boris and natasha obese kid mr o- mrs obese <laughs> so mr. mrs obese <laughs> so when oh, I, what a picture whenever i see someone you know who's slightly you know i just think of <laughs> mr and mrs obese obese i'm gonna buy that movie <laughs> you I need a how many times for the audience who this would have been released already Yes. How many times did you rent this movie? I had to rent that movie twice. Why did you have to rent it twice? Uh, So for our, you know, graphic images that you folks see on the thumbnails of your Spotify and YouTube uh, playings of this movie, as well as on our Twitter and Instagram, um, I had to find an image of Travolta and Boris and Tasha, but there's not one online. Uh, So I had to rent the movie a second time so I could get a screen grab of his cameo in it. Uh, So I did that for you folks. So how much did that thumbnail, thumbnail cost you? The thumbnail cost me like three bucks. As opposed to where it normally is free. Yes. You can just find it online. Yes. Look at that, everybody, it ladies and gentlemen. It was worth it for the consistency, Jeff though. Sweeney works for you. I work for you, The folks. people. The people. Yes. It is. I I, I prostrate, my, prostrate myself every day. We will take back the city and give it back to you. Yeah, the people. The people. Oh, yes. I was wondering what for breakfast. Your spirit or your body. So the bi- oh, that's enough pain. So the bikers, uh, no, the bikers take the kid take, or take the bit puppy. The, <laughs> take the kid. Take the puppy. The bikers kidnap Julie. Uh, Devito immediately is like, "Nope, not going with these folks." Jumps out the back of the bike. They're probably going to be the same folks that you see in Eyes of an Angel. Yes, they... the, those bikers ride off to Eyes of an Angel. Yes, um, where they fight dogs. Yes, what if, boy, what a crossover that would be. I, Travolta would have insisted. <laughs> um, but. The do- Davido runs away. He um, jumps off the bike. Yes. A puppy. Yes. The puppy jumps off the bike. Almost gets hit by a few cars. And like the camera angles that when it jumps off the bike, it's almost like the camera takes on the POV of the dog. Yeah. The dog vision is very weird. It's just like it a is, scrunched frame. It's like anamorphic, but not stretched. Yes. That's exactly what it is. Yeah. It's probably how they shot it. To be it's honest. It's extremely strange. Yeah. Very distorted. Uh, so, uh, but the the puppy's running around. He finds and, a homeless yeah, guy. Yeah, homeless guy gives him some food, and then cut to several months later. Molly. Well, we get we get one of those boards I was talking about, uh, like a child's drawing, and it says, "Mommy got a new job." Man, I missed all of this. It's stuff. very strange. I missed all that. Uh, we cut to Molly's new job. She is an elf. She's a at Santa Santa's elf workshop. for a mall Santa. Yes. Um. She makes a joke that I love so much at the beginning of this. Because a bunch of kids are like, Who are you? Are you an elf? And she looks at this kid and says, No, I'm, I'm a, Vulcan. a Vulcan. You want me to give you the nerve pinch? And it's like, You know, because Kirstie Alley played Savik in Star Trek II Wrath of Khan. She's already, she's cracking the jokes about being a Vulcan again. Yeah. Um, the biggest disrespect in all of Star Trek is that Savik is not in Star Trek VI as the character who betrays uh, the Enterprise crew. That is my hot take on Star Trek right now. <laughs> Damn, um, okay. Bringing up the Star Savik Trek Savik should take. absolutely be in the Undiscovered Country as, um, I forget the Vulcan's name who betrays them, but uh, it should be Savik for the history instead of this new character. Uh, I have it, it thoughts, yes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that happens. Uh, she makes that joke. It's great. Uh, there's like an hour wait to meet Santa because there's this one kid who's really backing it up. He's like, I want a helicopter. I want XYZ. I want a million dollars. Yes. 
Um, but she uh, skirts the rules and lets Mikey and Julie in, sneak in. And Mikey gets on Santa's lap. And says, like, what do you want, my son? And Mikey says, I want a, a, dog. a dog. And, and cut this is to. kind of a funny, it's a cursed-ass Santa, mind you. Cursed ass Santa. Yes, he's literally credited in the credits like sleazy Santa or something. Oh like that. <laughs> man, why is he sleazy? <laughs> but cursed Santa. Why? Uh, I think this scene's actually kind of funny, where he's holding Mikey in his lap. Yeah. But Santa's like dotting his eyes back and forth and looking at Travolta and Kirstie Alley behind, and they're making notions. And of they're like, like, no, no, they're, no. They whisper like Mikey or the mouth Mikey. Oh yeah. Uh, so that Santa's like, oh what, Mikey, what you... and Mikey's like, you know my name. Yeah. Crazy. And then he's like, I want a dog. And Santa like looks at the parents and they're like, no. no. And he's like, well, you know, I can't control living things. You'll find the perfect dog. And if I can bring it to you, I will. Yeah. It's like the most diplomatic ass Santa sentence I've ever heard. Yeah. You um, know, it's a it's a it's not a sleazy Santa. What a movie this is. Right. Um. So then uh, then uh, Julie immediately cries. Yes, Julie immediately cries. Which is what my brother did when we both got to Santa, the mall <laughs> Santa. Is I told Santa that I wanted... I don't remember. Do you remember anything you told of mall Santa that what you wanted for Christmas? Yeah, it was probably just like, give me more Star Wars action figures, please. Oh, for me, it was probably, uh, I want the newest Star Wars lightsaber toy yes. or something like that. Something like that. But my brother, when he was young, little, would cry when he got on mm-hmm. Santa's lap. So Molly does that. Yes. He cries. Then, uh, it's at this point, Molly is, like, in the break room of the mall where she's taking her, like, yeah. elf co- costumes off and all that stuff. And Mikey wanders off. And he and sees he finds Santa, Santa. Who rips his beard off. Right. And it's and just a dude the, who looks like Wayne Knight. <laughs> and he says, you're not Santa. Yeah. And that's when Mikey yeah. knows the truth. Yeah, and it, it, that is Mikey's arc in this movie is learning to believe in Santa again. Which is, like, terrible. Yes. I mean, you should just be honest with your kid and just tell them, like, hey, yeah. sorry. Yeah, you, the, you the, knew the truth earlier than most. The next scene is another very weird scene. Um, Mikey's, like, pouting in bed. Oh, my God. The chipmunk yeah. scene. Yes. And then Charlta like, slips his hand in the door, pops a cassette tape into, like, a child's cassette tape player, and starts playing. <laughs> and the door swings open. Travolta, Kirstie Alley, and Julie perform a rather impressively choreographed um, lip sync performance of Alan and the Chipmunks Christmas. So, like, they had to work on this. Yes, this was rehearsed for a couple times. hours. Yes, because they, they have movements set up. They're, like, bouncing back and forth. Julie's in, like, a, a, a tutu. A, a tutu. Like a fairy dress. Yeah. It does not work. Mikey's not amused. Right. At this point, I wrote, what a picture. Um, <laughs> there's a lot of these moments where it's yes. like highly choreographed bits mm-hmm. don't do anything for the plot yes a lot of bits and it's just like okay cool i'm like this is entertaining in a, some respect but let's make this movie cook let's just let's get going let's, let's make yeah we gotta be cooking with gas right now right this, now you're right now you're holding a bic lighter up to a piece of wood we gotta we gotta speed this up yeah it, it, this movie felt very long for those reasons yeah. for me because like it's only an hour and a half long. I think the second one was an hour and fifteen. Yes, but the second one flies by. Mm-hmm. This one drags. Yeah, a lot for it, the, these reasons. It drags a lot, but I, I just thought it was so weird that <laughs> I was entertained. I was like, why is this? Like, what is this movie? What is this? Like Charles Barkley dream sequence? Yes, which is what happens next. I yes. believe Julie is sitting down in front of the TV once again, staring dead into this like with her dead eyes into this NBA game where Charles Barkley's playing, watching the basketball men. And then we zoom in on the TV. Yeah. We have entered another dimension. No. <laughs> um, we're inside the game. We're inside. And Charles Barkley himself, playing himself. Playing himself. Um, is He shoots a hoop, and then he turns around and hears, Coom, Coom, Coom. It's Julie. It's Julie. Who jumps. Who is oh, dribbling a basketball. She's dribbling a basketball. She runs down the court jumps in the air literally flies over him slam dunk slam dunk and she's still up in the air yeah because she it's a she believes that basketball players can fly yeah basketball players yeah i think you said baseball Uh, she believes basketball players can fly basketball players yeah uh it's at this point when i understand her true intentions where she wants she wants to go slam dunk on charles barkley she wants to slam dunk on charles barkley 
She has some interest. She has some interest. Yeah. Slam dunk on she was, she's two years old, but still already playing the game. But she's playing the game with yeah. Charles Barkley. Charles Barkley has, I think he has like one line, maybe. I can't remember. One or two at most. Yeah. Th- this movie misses the joy of Charles Barkley acting. Yeah. Um, because Charles Barkley is not a good actor, but that is what makes him such a good actor. Is that he is just so bizarre and strange. If you ever want something like to really grab your interest for an hour, watch any episode of SNL he's hosted. They are bizarro world like skit comedy shows. Yeah. Or even watch him in Space Jam, a movie that is not great, but that he is pretty good in charles barkley is in space jam he is in space jam he's one of the ones who the mon stars uh take the powers of oh and he spends the whole movie like he's like going to church and he's like praying to god he's like if i ever get my pa-, like it's horribly delivered but so funny because he's so strange yeah um but yeah this movie does not use any of his good acting qualities and just has him like stand there back wow julie you're great that's it yeah and then she's out of the that's dream. the cheese she's out of the dream uh, we never that never plays into anything else. Nope. Except for her fact that he she believes people can fly. And there's like maybe one tiny little scene, but there is no payoff for that whole yeah. bit. Uh, after that, we're back with Devito. Um, yeah. Who is running around still with the homeless guy, but now an adult dog. Yeah, it's been a few months now. Yeah, but then twist. He gets captured by animal control. Another representation of animal control being the bad guys. Because we had just watched Eyes of an Angel. Yes. Another movie where animal control are the bad guys. Mm -hmm. And it's such a common thing in so many movies where animal control are seen as like evil people. And I'm like, bitches, they're doing their their jobs. Do you want rabid dogs in the streets to like bite people and give them rabies Mm -hmm. and like have them die of infections? Like, no, we we need animal control to get stray animals off the seat. So... You know, to I all I say to uh, look who's talking now, production team, the writer, whoever it was, animal control, they're not evil people. Yeah. Stop making them look like evil people. Uh, but Mikey, um, I jumped a little ahead, but he gets taken into animal control into the pound. And they're feeding him liver. Mm, yes. Which the dogs realize, oh, that means you're up next. Yep. You're like, up next for what? To take the long nap. To, to take the down. long nap. But next, um, we cut back quickly to the family, where um, yep. Travolta's been away for a while. Like he's been working with this he's been with Samantha, with his boss. He's been yeah. flying for a while. Yeah. Um, and um, he's wants to make it up to his kids, so he decides he will take Mikey to go buy a dog, because the same pound that Devito's at. Um, and the take a little stock of the dogs that are available right now for rent or not rent for adoption. Um. <laughs> I don't know if you call this. This is kind of a this is a very strange thing. There's a, a Nazi dog among these. Wait, Did you catch that? No. So it, they're going down the dogs and they all have like fun accents. There's like Scottish ones that are talking like this and whatnot. There's a German dog. And he goes past and goes, I will follow others. Oh no. There's a Nazi dog oh, in this movie. No. That dog is gonna commit hate crimes. <laughs> so they should not adopt it. It's but, this, um, like, who thought, like, yeah, this family movie, let's put a Nazi dog in it. There's, I mean, of all family franchise movies, Look Who's Talking is the franchise where it's like, they're going to push the limits of what a family movie yes. is. <laughs> we have full opening openings. Yes. We have adults. A lot of sexual tension. A lot of sexual tension. And it's about babies, puppies being born, for God's sake. Mm-hmm. Like, there's going to be sex in it. And yeah. so, it, and... You know, they say swear words and cuss words. And yeah, all, it, all the worst words, like damn and hell. And bitch. And they say H-E double bendy straws in this H-E one. H-E double hockey stick. <laughs> 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 so uh, but so then it's at this point, um, John, uh, John Travolta is with his family again. Yes. And he takes Mikey to this pound, right? Yeah, well, that's what we just said. And did we already get to them picking up Yeah, the, the they see... DeVito, and he runs over. Not actually Danny DeVito. Yeah, Danny DeVito's walking around. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but no, Danny DeVito, do- Danny DeVito was definitely not on set for this movie. He no. 100% showed up for six hours, recorded all of his lines, and got $500,000. Yep. I, w- I want that line. You know, pe- you know, you could be like, why would DeVito and Diane Keaton do this movie? And it's like, no, I know exactly why. It was a six-hour day of work, 
and they got paid a shit ton of money for it. Yeah. More than I will probably ever see. And what's sad about this scene, though, is that, you know, as John Travolta and Mike here in this pound, they see the dog, Danny DeVito dog, yeah. being taken by uh, one of the animal control workers to the place where they're going to put yeah. the dog down. The bad place. And it, the dog runs to Mikey, pins him on the ground. And it's almost like, oh, like he picked you, like he wants to be with you. And then he, uh, the animal control guy comes up and says, oh, no, this dog is set to be destroyed. And so then the dog tackles and Travolta John, says he's John like, Travolta. He's like, I guess a change of plans. Or... Yeah, he says something along those lines. But then what happens later in the movie that people probably don't recognize is he r- yanks the dog out of their hands and then puts it down in front of them. <laughs> he snaps his neck. <laughs> its neck in front of mikey and then throws the dog into mikey's hand said there there's your dog Mm -hmm. but no that does not happen it does not happen (laughs) they they adopt see there are multiple parts of this movie where if they just tweak a few things it becomes so much more interesting but the uh they they did not do that they bring the dog home they bring the dog home they name it rocks Rocks. which is like why did you name the dog rock (laughs) i have no idea not rock for short for rocky but rocks yes they had a reason for naming it rocks, too. Did I, they? Because it was like, because he laid a rock in your back seat of his cab. Because he pooped in his oh, back seat of his cab. That happens? It was very short. Oh, I Very that. quick, yeah. Uh, but his name's Rocks. A great a great name. And as they bring that dog home, who other is at his apartment other then than... Samantha, his Samantha, boss. Samantha, his boss. Who has brought them another, another dog, dog named Daphne, Daphne. Voiced by Diane Keaton. Yep. This one is a poodle? Yes, a uh, very manicured poodle with a lot of uh, requirements. This is a pampered city dog, whereas yes. Rox is a um, down-to-earth street dog. Mm-hmm. Classic uh, um, Lady in the Tramp style, you know, story. style story. So, um, Yeah, and so the two of them are combative immediately. Yeah, uh, um, yeah, and also... Christy always started to have suspicions about Travolta and Samantha... And she's also arguing with John Travolta, like, we can't have two dogs. And so they make this pact that we'll find out which dog we like more, and then we'll give the other one away. Which, fucking horrible. Yes. Because, listen, if you are going to, like, keep a dog with you just to then give it away while your kids bond with it. Like, imagine the end of this movie, right? Yeah. They say, okay, we've decided, and Rox is the dog we're going to give away. And how that's going to break Mikey's heart. Like, and the rocks will probably be put down. Definitely put down. You just imagine, yeah. like, if that movie... Act, uh, spoiler alert. Movie doesn't do that. Thankfully. But imagine if it did. Be rough. Be awful. Be really rough, rough. Rough, rough. But no, obviously, both the dogs make it. Yeah, the um, dogs do make it. So then there's, like, a montage of them yeah. taking care of the dogs. Yeah, The next, like, hour of the movie after this is just wheel spinning. Yeah. The, that was basically the end of the plot for like an hour that we just described. So the next hour is just everyone's in the same place that they're at. Yeah. Doing the same thing. So should we wrap this up, Jeff? Yeah. Well, no, thank you all for, <laughs> no. for the next hour. Like we'll go into some specific moments, but the basic gist is like Travolta is working is a lot, working a lot away from his family. His Kirstie, boss wants to get into his pants. Yeah. Kirstie always getting jealous. Okay. His boss, Samantha. Yeah. The most insanely dastard, the most insane, like, dastardly, like, super villain plan ever. Just to sleep with her pilot. Yeah. She's like, we're going to fly to a remote cabin in the mountains. I'm going to oh, disconnect oh, the phone I'm cables. I'm going to disconnect the phone cables. I'm going to create Bond. a fake appointment that I have with the CEO of a different, like, Co- co- corporation. I'm going to print out corporate letterhead gonna... from this person so that you will be fooled. <laughs> <laughs> and then I'm going to light a fire and then we're going to, you're going to teach me how to dance. I'm going to And des- then we're going to fuck. It's the most <laughs> insane supervillain plan for the least like reward. <laughs> she just, I mean, she just wants to fuck her pilot. She could dead ass just ask him. <laughs> like straight up. <laughs> Well, no, she goes because through, he's married. She Jeff. goes through all this and still loses. She could have just been like, hey, are you interested in an affair? And he would just said no. And she'd be like, okay, I guess this is not worth the effort. Yeah. Instead of, she she spent the money on the gas for this plane. 
And she like threatens him with his job at some point where it's like, well, I got to let go 3,000 people unless if you come with me to this corporate gig. Yeah. On Christmas Eve. Oh, ha, ha, ha. Ha, 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 ha. So. But yeah. Um, while they're they're working back and forth, um, it's around this point when I just wrote like, this movie is like a totally acceptable Christmas programmer. It's like, it's there. It's present. It's fine. It, it does have its Christmas moments. Yeah. Yeah. It's like. I don't hate this movie, but I don't like it either. I'll I accept it. I do hate it. You hate it. I mean, again, there's so many directions this movie could have gone, which would have made it so much more interesting. Mm-hmm. Like, so we're gonna bounce around the plot a lot. So I'm just gonna bounce. Can I bounce around a scene at the end? Or should we keep uh, no, going? No, let's keep going. Let's okay, keep going. Okay. Because during this, while they're away so much, there's a dream. There's the dream sequence. Oh yes, where. Uh, Molly dreams that Travolta's Travolta flamenco dancing is with. flamenco dancing with his boss, whereas John Travolta is dreaming that Molly is hooking is up with her, her old boss, boss the Al- guy from the first movie, Albert. Albert from the first movie. Albert from the first. Who's movie. in like a three shot cameo in this? Yeah, uh, played by George Siegel again. R.I.P. R.I.P. Recently, R.I.P. Yeah. Um. But it's kind of an audacious sequence. I liked the dream sequence. Uh, my favorite part that happens is that um, Kirstie Alley makes the boss disappear. Yes. But the only things that are left are breast implants. Yes, and they fall to the ground. And they fall. To... She's like, I knew it. They were real. I knew they were real. Like, family movie. Yes, family movie. <laughs> family movie. Um, but it does end in a rather nice, like, like classical dance sequence between Travolta and Kirstie Alley underneath the moon. You no, know, if you have Travolta, you're gonna make him dance in your movie. Absolutely, dance monkey dance. Uh, he, he's getting paid. Yeah. Um, but uh, it's I kind of I do like the dream sequence. I think it's in, I think it's fun. I think there's a little bit of like interesting filmmaking going on there. Um, it's a shame the rest of the movie does not adopt its its uh, energy. Yeah, because um, they wake up and plot twist. Neither of them is cheating on the. The whole thing is a giant misunderstanding that results in so much chaos. Yeah, because at no point is either of them going to betray. Well, the it's other. mostly a misunderstanding on Molly's part. I mean, James' misunderstanding is thinking that his boss doesn't want to fuck him. Which, if you're John Travolta being a pilot, everybody wants yeah. to fuck you. And at the end, when she tries to fuck him, he's just like, "No," and then he leaves. And that's it. That's the danger. That's the danger. Like, there's no temptation that he's like, oh, yeah, the, I've been away from my wife for so long, so maybe this one time. Like, this movie doesn't give him mm, temptation. What if he did? What if he cheated on her in this movie? Would that not make it so much more interesting? Um, Yeah, if he had, even if he hadn't cheated, if he had considered it. Right. Because he never considers it. He just gets really close with his boss and then turns away when she tries to make it something more. Mm-hmm. There's no tension. Yeah. Absolutely none. Yeah, so... um. The tension is, how much longer is this movie going to run for? (laughs) (laughs) That's exactly my thought, because after the dream sequence, uh, Rox and Daphne go out on the town. Yes, the dogs. Um, Daphne had been trying to sabotage Rox and, like, biting shoes and blaming it on him and all that. Right, because Rox has not had a good reputation. He pees on the carpet, he rips up Molly's shoes, and he's on, like, thin ice with Molly. Whereas Daphne, on the other hand, is, like, the pretty... Yeah, the perfectly behaved dog. Perfectly behaved dog. And Rox is trying to teach teach Daphne his ways of like being a street dog, um, but it's during that sequence they started getting close and like they go mudding at some point, yeah. and Daphne's like, "Oh, this is they have a, a they have a little uh, lady in the tramp night." At yeah, they Ita- do. They sit outside of an Italian restaurant. Yeah. Um, so then but- I, th- I, th- I think, uh, and it was after that we get to like it gets more Christmassy, and that's when I wrote down what you're kind of saying yeah. earlier, which is like this movie feels long, yes. too fucking long. It's because it's, it's this movie has two plot lines, which already would make a thing feel longer. Which neither of them has any dramatic tension, so you aren't like you're like oh, I can't I can't wait to figure out what's going to happen next. There's no tension in either plot line. And they also are put on pause in the second yeah. act. So you're just watching wheel spinning. Yep. And I don't know if you've ever sat down and just watched a wheel spin. It's not that engaging after like 30 seconds. Right. There's a lot of like bits that don't yeah. have anything to do with it's it. It's a lot of bits, back to back bits. Yeah. So then it's Christmas time. Yeah, like, we've honestly just skipped over, like, 45 minutes of the movie. Yeah, I had and, other notes written down of what happens, but I honestly, it's, like, not and, but much it's, to talk about. It's like, about. we didn't really skip over 45 minutes. There's just nothing that we can talk... 
if we were to talk about this for five minutes, it would just be us explaining what happened. It's just like the dogs misbehave. Uh, Molly's by herself. Uh, Travolta's the- with his boss. Rinse and repeat that exact cycle we just talked exact about. Exact cycle. Yes. So, I mean, we could do that, but it wouldn't no, be very... No, we're not going to do that to you folks. It would, be very, it would not be very engaging, yeah. and we're also at 55 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> so and, and so that's basically that section of the movie. Things finally kind of, like, pick up. Like, there's something that happens at the end where she and... where um, This is the Christmas moment, Samantha right? enacts this dastardly plan. Yes. Where she's like, I need you to take me... To the mountains! In, the, in a cabin. In a cabin! In my private plane! And, and then, if you don't, I have to fire 3,000 people! <laughs> <laughs> Your choice, Mr. Brachio! <laughs> 3,000 people, people, or you come to the cabin! He goes to the cabin. <laughs> um. <laughs> he goes to the cabin. He goes to the cabin. And uh, he calls Molly, who's like, he's like, she's like, he's having an affair. He's having an affair. And, <laughs> and he, this is that point when uh, she's with her parents. Yeah, and it's Christmas Eve. And her mom is like, no, like, he's not probably having an affair. And she tells like, this this insane story about her uh, dad. Yeah, her husband, Molly's dad. Who was stuck on an tra- island Stuck on an island in World War II and with there were 13 th- beautiful U- women. USO girls. Yes. And, and he never betrayed her. And he never betrayed her. He only told them how much he loves his wife. Which is supposed to make Molly feel better. Yes. How? And it's like a sto- it's like a story with no tension. <laughs> Much like this story, there's no tension to it. Right. So uh, that's when, as John Travolta is trying to like get word to Molly about the situation, uh, Molly and her kids are like, "Where's Daddy? Where's Daddy?" So eventually, she says, "Okay, you know what? If Daddy can't come to Christmas, we're gonna be Christmas to Daddy." Yes. <laughs> Which um, is what this title the movie should have been. Daddy is, wanted three. Daddy wanted Christmas. Daddy wanted Christmas. Or Christmas wanted daddy. Because it was daddy wanted, daddy wanted two. Daddy wanted dogs for Christmas. Ooh. No, that's still dumb. No, I like daddy wanted Christmas. Daddy wanted Christmas. Yeah. A daddy wanted Christmas. A daddy wanted Christmas. Yeah. Yes. It, has, it has two meanings. It has multiple meanings. First, you know, just it is a daddy wanted Christmas. Like, yeah. It is the movie, but also it's a daddy who wanted Christmas. <laughs> as Travolta does in this movie. He wants Christmas. He wants Christmas with his family. But he can't get it because of his maniacal boss. His maniacal James Bond boss. Who? Fun fact. I, this is a divergence. I'm just reading this. Apparently, Olivia Newton-John was considered for the role of Samantha. Can you imagine that? Which would have been funny. It would have been really funny. Honestly, most of our problems about uh, the tension in this movie would have been solved just by that casting because they have such an inherent chemistry. And that would that would have been, been like, yeah, they're gonna, they're of course gonna smash. They're gonna, <laughs> but there's there's absolutely none of that tension because right we've now. seen them smash on camera before twice. <laughs> twice. <laughs> um, but no, she didn't. She did not take the role because she was going through her best breast cancer struggle at the time. Yeah. Uh, thankfully, she's still with us twenty some years later. Exactly. But she still needs to answer for that dog she yes. got fired on yeah, two of a l- kind. Two of a kind. We will not rest we until will an not apology rest. is issued. Olivia Newton John, until you answer for your crimes. It, it has to happen. <laughs> um, but yeah, she she gets in the cab with the family and the dogs and decides I'm going to drive to the cabin where yeah. Travolta and uh, Samantha are currently trapped because it's snowing out. And she's like, you can't, you can't go to see your family because it's snowing. snowing. It's like, well, you're, I got to get to the driver. It's like, the driver's gone. The only choice is to sleep with me, <laughs> Mr. Ubracchio. <laughs> this is exactly what's happening in the movie. This is the exact thing that's happening. It's, it's, it's she, she doesn't have a mustache to twirl, but yes. oh God, if she had a mustache to twirl, yeah. it would be perfect um, timing. But so Kirstie Alley drives up, like, why did he have to take a plane there if she can drive to it? Well, that's the thing. It's, where did he fly to? And then Molly apparently drives there. Yeah, in upstate New York. And, like, why is she able to drive there within, like, two hours when he took a plane? Because she's a CEO of whatever the fuck corporation. Yeah, whatever company. It's and never, she it's never not... said what the company is. Um, it doesn't? I don't think so. What if they make breast implants? That would explain a lot. That would explain a lot. But they the uh, they drive up there. Um, As they're driving, uh, Mal, Julie says something, and Molly turns around to see what it is, and then they almost crash into a tree, but they skid and swerve and fall off a cliff, and and they die. Yeah, and they, it's very sad. No, they they, they do skid down a cliff though. <laughs> <laughs> 
the car and, uh, catches on fire. Wind the up kids are clearing. trying to like shake their mom awake. It's like, mommy, mommy, wake up. And the fires engulf yeah. the car. And then they... It explodes. Explodes. No, they wind up in a clearing in the woods. James then just says, you know what? I'm going to brave the storm. And he starts walking. Yes. And he's walking well, no. in the woods and he finds the charred car and the charred <laughs> bodies. He pulls and, the bodies the, the, out of the car. The only... And he screams, Well, No! no! No, well, when he gets there, the bodies are charred, and Rox is standing there eating them, being like, cooked meat. Uh, no. I didn't kill my own <laughs> You good? <sighs> this is what I mean, though, Jeff, is this movie could have just taken two quick, small turns. <laughs> Immediately more interesting film. Yes. Immediately more interesting movie. <laughs> it didn't do any of those uh, things. We are, we are so broken today. Um, <laughs> this is what happens when you make us watch three of these movies <laughs> after ten movies of pure nonsense. And as he's holding his charred family in his arms with Julie's arm ripped off because Rox ate it, the wolves come in <laughs> and they and, finish the well, job well, by no, wiping the Ubrachio house well, no, off it the turns map. Into, it turns into a remake of The Grey. <laughs> 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 Where it's revolted in the woods with a bunch of wolves. Why did um, we get this movie? Yeah, uh, so... None of that what, happened. Yeah, what actually happens is they wind up in a clearing, and They're, the wolves actually do show up. The <laughs> wolves do show up. <laughs> there are a bunch of wolves, and they all talk like this. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah I think I'm going to eat that. Like some one. mafia guys. Oh, yeah, they yeah. talk like mafia guys. Hey, pretty lady there. Mafiosos. We're going to eat ya. Oh, um, yeah. And so Roxon jumps out of the car and fights the wolves off. And wins. Yes, he beats off three wolves. Just one. Oh, yeah, he only beats one, and the other two follow that guy out. I thought it was just one wolf. No, there's, there's at least two there. In the first scene? Yes. Because there's two scenes with wolves. Yeah, three show up later, but there's at least two in that first scene. Wow. I okay. At least I, I, I could swear. I thought it was just one, and he beat the one wolf. Maybe. Maybe I just wasn't paying attention. Well, because if there were multiple wolves, like, they, they'd rip yes. rocks apart. I mean, yeah. realistically, one wolf will kill rocks. Yes. But rocks beats the beats the wolf. Because rocks is a wolf fucking... Wolf slash wolves, he beats Rocks is a fucking dragon. Yes. And he's injured, but he's still ready to go. He's still ready to he's go. He's like... And he tells Daphne, we gotta do this thing together. And Daphne goes off to find help. They pull him Rock, more bound and yeah. find feet do, people. Do, 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 do. Rox goes off to find... Um, uh, J- uh, James. Um, Rox goes yes, off. Yes, Rox goes on to find James. And he does. And James and him are at the door. And Samantha's like, if you walk out the door without sleeping with me, you'll be fired! <laughs> well, you forgot, like, there's a line that... Um, Rock says as he comes through and he sees Samantha up in her like uh, yeah. tight fit black dress and says, "Oh, is she in heat?" <laughs> <laughs> uh, but yeah, then afterwards she's like, "If you don't sleep with me, you'll be fired. You'll be fired. And Lightning sa- strike, organ music." Yes. <laughs> and he's like, "Oh, whatever." And he leaves. <laughs> and he leaves. Uh, Rock runs over and pees on her, and that's the end of her story in this movie. Yep, we never see Samantha ever again. Yep, uh, because he gets fired, presumably. Presumably, I mean, she's you know, there's actually a plot line that's not acknowledged in this movie is that. Uh, Kirstie Alley's mom says, oh, I know people. I could get her audited. Um, and then There's later... Scene later, she's like, what do you mean I'm getting audited? Yeah, but we never we never get a payoff to that. It just nope. happens. Right. Um, but yeah, Th- Travolta and Rock start running through the woods again. Meanwhile, Daphne, Daphne finds, finds the ranger station. Park rangers. Yes. And the rangers show... <laughs> you are already packing your book up. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I have no more notes on this movie. <laughs> um... Yet, um, uh, I'm trying to think. Well, what Daphne happened? found the rangers. Oh, Daphne found the rangers, and the rangers uh, show up and rescue the family. They rescue the family. While, in the meantime, Rox is leading uh, John Travolta back to the car. Yeah. In the middle of such... More wolves show up. More wolves show up. And Rox tries to fight them off, and then we cut to an ultra-wide of the forest, and we hear barking wolves. noise. And we're like, yeah. what's going to happen? Did John Travolta die? Yeah. Did he get eaten by wolves? And then... I like to think he did. They're in the ranger station, and the ranger's like, it's too snowy, I can't let you guys go out on Christmas, but I need to be with my husband on Christmas, and the kids need to be with their father, and the kids are all mopey, and And Mikey's like, Santa doesn't exist, Christmas is dead. (laughs) (laughs) He's like, Santa found dead in a ditch. (laughs) But then the door opens, and who should walk in? James. Daddy wanted. Daddy wanted. James himself, John Trollsey, comes in. 
And he's like, I had to make it. I made it to be with Christmas with my family. And it's a lot of hugging. And like, but where's Rox? And you think it's going to be like the Homeward Bound. Where Rox is dead. But then James is like, the funniest thing. <laughs> <laughs> this wolf bites my jacket. Bites into my transponder. His pager. My because pager. We forgot an earlier bit that happened yeah. in this movie, which it's is established when, that when the it, pager makes dogs angry when it goes because off. Because the pager has like high frequency yeah. sounds. He's like, the wolf bit in my thing, and all the wolves scatter. And then Rox runs in. It's like, hey! hey! <laughs> and then Rox and Daphne made, make out. Okay, but better ending to this movie. They're in the park ranger forest, right? Yes. Door opens. John Travolta walks in, but he's all bloodied up and torn up. <laughs> Dragging <laughs> Rox's <laughs> corpse. <laughs> He's like, I need to fight the other one. The wolf. man is dead on the inside because he's seen he's like, so I saw much some shit. <laughs> and he's just holding Rox's body in his arms, and the kids all run to it. And that's how the movie should that, end. That should be the ending. And he says, Merry Christmas, you filthy animal. <laughs> but the movie, that's not how the movie yeah, ends, unfortunately. The movie ends with the whole family has been reunited. They get to spend Christmas together. And, and the park says, ranger goes over to his, his uh, radio and he's oh, like, oh, I'm fuck. picking something up. I and he flips fucking through, hated this part. And he flips to a station near, oh, oh, oh. oh, oh. No, and Mikey Christmas. and Julia are like, it is Santa. Santa. Mikey's like, I guess I was wrong. He's real. And the whole family embraces. They get to spend Christmas together. Cut to credits. Except the movie's not over yet. What happens during the credits, Jeff? Um, there's a music video <laughs> by hit French singer Jordy. Jordy. Um, who, number one, is the youngest person ever to have a number one charted single. Uh, a French actor who was uh, five years old at the time of this movie coming out. Wow. A French singer um, who performs a song called It's Christmas, Say Noel, from the album, uh, from his album, Christmas. Um. It is abrasive. It's terrible. <laughs> but it's cut to this music video of this kid who like looks like he doesn't want to be singing or be in a music video. Yeah. Jordy, dancing with the two kids from this movie. Uh, Mikey and Julie. Mikey and Julie. As Santa's on their roof, bounding up and down, throwing presents down a chimney. While Molly and, and James wake James. up to find gifts in their room. And they see like a, a house miniature. Yeah. And it's like... Doo -doo 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 do, 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 is Christmas. Say, say Noel. This, this Christmas. Christmas. Say Noel. And that's that's the end of this movie. Um, it ends with this music video that I was like, oh my god. <laughs> end it, please. <laughs> and it goes on for the whole credits. So there's, you don't even get the satisfaction of the music video ending. Credits taking over the whole screen and like, oh, okay, I can turn the movie off a little earlier. I just get to watch silence with the credits. The but whole thing. The whole uh, the movie video goes through the whole entire yes. credits. Oh, my God. Um, and then the movie ends, as does the look who's talking trilogy, as does this era of Travolta's career. We are done the first stage of his career. The first stage. That's a 20... That's a 20-year stage that we covered, though. Yeah. Or... We covered from... 18 years. 1975. Yeah, Devil's Rams, 1975, so we covered 18 years. 18 years. That's the first stage of, uh, you know... What are we going to call that stage? The... Uh, the beginnings of Travolta. I think it's beginnings. The the rise, fall, redemption. Well, it's just, I think this is just, in a sense, the rise. Like, if you look at, like, his whole career as a chart, mm -hmm. even though he collapsed in the 80s, as a whole, this is still upward momentum. Mm -hmm. Because the next stage we're covering is his A-list stardom. From Pulp Fiction on to Hairspray. Uh, so that's like his peak. This is still the rising action of that, even though we've had 10 years of absolute non-existent movies. Right. Um, this is the rise. We have the A-list um, section coming up next, and then we will get to what the third one is at some point down the line. Yeah. Um, 20 episodes. Yeah, we did 20 episodes. This is our 20th episode. Well, let me quickly uh, do the aftermath of this movie. Yeah. Uh, it's just to really button it up. Yeah. Uh, so this movie made $10 million on a $22 million budget. Uh, huge flop. It's why they never made another one, besides the fact that Travolta becomes an A-list star and probably would have cost way too much after this. Um, this movie is one of the only movies with a 0% on Rotten Tomatoes. Um, I, think it, I don't think it deserves a 0%, uh, but obviously no one liked this movie. No one went to see this movie. Um, this movie mostly is faded into irrelevance. I think the first one kind of still has a cultural footprint. Uh, second one, maybe. Third one, absolutely not. I've never heard anyone talk about this movie. Did you find or recognize any Scientology parallels with this one? 
No. You had you said something about the dreams. Well, it was just the fact that there there's a we talked about this dream sequence where like they connect their dreams, like they incept each other. Mm. And when watching that, I thought, okay, there's got to be some Scientology literature on this. Mm. There is not, not one. Yeah, Scientology actually doesn't value dreams as much. Interesting from the research that I did. So I guess I couldn't really find. Anything yeah, I mean, it makes either. sense. This one. It, it, this one seems like a cash grab movie that didn't work out. Yeah. The first two, there's some passion behind it. Um, this one's like everyone is here for the paycheck. Basically, yeah. Uh, it's made by a total like workman of a director. Um, and then obviously their bet to make more money didn't pay off and they lost money. Um, 12 million. In most, res- this um, doesn't really affect anyone's career, though. Um, Amy Huckling is not involved. Travolta goes on to have a huge success right after this. Right. Christy Alley, the finale of Cheers is happening around this time, so it's kind of the end of her era um, in Hollywood. Mm-hmm. But she's she's around and pops up in things. Yeah. Um, and that's that's pretty much the movie. That's pretty much this era. That's pretty much all of it, man. Yeah. So You know what we need to do? What do we need Air to do? Airport. Cue the hair ranking. All right. Yeah. Welcome to the hair ranking report. This is going to be really short and sweet. Put it below. Look who's talking to above basements. The there look who's go. talking trilogy is going to go back to back to back with each other. Yes. Look who's talking now is popping in uh, below. Look who's talking now above basements. I have zero thoughts because it's the same hair from the look who's talking trilogy. There is no difference. And that was the hair report. And that was the hair report. Cue the music. <laughs> All right. That was the hair. <laughs> that was the hair report. Um, we, yeah, that's, that's it. <laughs> uh, that's basically it any yeah. any overall um recaps that we should do for era wise or i think we're gonna have a little special episode okay um next week that you folks can listen to where yeah. we're gonna um quickly recap um talk about this era of travolta before we launch into the next era of yeah. travolta what movie are we covering next, Jeff? Yeah, after that, you folks have uh, Pulp Fiction to look forward to. Pulp Fiction. A drastic change in quality from this. Yeah. Um, a movie that not only heralded a new era of Travolta's career, but er- heralded a new era of Hollywood itself. I'm uh, reading a lot of stuff about that movie, so I will be well informed when we go into it. I will not be reading a lot from that movie. It is very nice after 10 like, years of movies of no context. To have something that I can really dig into. Yeah. Right. Um, So we'll have a lot to talk about with Pulp Fiction in two weeks. Yeah. Next week, you have folks have a short recap episode. And um, see you next week. Yeah. Um, Do the whole outro thing. You got a whole little spiel, man. I do. Uh, Thank you, folks, for listening. Uh, Please remember to rate, review, subscribe on whatever platform you're listening on. As a reminder, we're on Spotify, Apple Podcast, Apple Music um youtube and google podcasts we're still on google podcast we are still on google podcast we are still on google podcast we are still on google podcast <laughs> yes you would are. know uh, we are yes we are we, we are. are yeah that's what i'm saying uh, you can follow us at trolling pod on twitter or instagram follow me on twitter at jeff w sweeney uh you can follow me on at stewart Elmer 95 also your personal Instagram is now the Travolta Instagram, as I found yes, out. Yes, I do not have a personal Instagram anymore, so it's just at Travolta Pod. You used to, but I now did. you don't have one anymore. I do not. It's, it's hidden. just Travolta Pod. Um, yeah, so Travol- if you message any of the Travolta accounts, I will respond from it. Um, but I can as well, because I have the login info. Yeah. You can pop into our Reddit, r slash Travolta. Um, and then, as always, thank you to Rebecca Johnson for our graphic design. Amazing. And Michael Van Bodegum Smith for our theme music. Lovely. That is now taking you guys out. See you next week for that recap and then Pulp Fiction the week after. Bye. Bye.